If you'll turn in your copy of the scripture to Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, picking up in verse 24 is where we're going to be. Um, I am grateful to Pastor Nate, he's going to be the one preaching for you next week, and so you pray for him as he prepares this week and uh, gets ready to um, Share the word with you. Actually, we're going to be in verse 21. Sorry about that. My bad. Uh, Verse 21, if you would stand with me, please, and let me read aloud from my copy of the Scripture. You follow along in yours. I'm going to read 21 through 43, uh, beginning in verse 21, Mark chapter 5. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat on the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Now, if you'll remember, let's park there for a second. Uh, last week, we were in on uh, Jesus had crossed over the Sea of Galilee to the land of Gadara, to the land of the Gadarenes. He ministered there to the uh, 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 the Gadarene man who was possessed by the legion of demons, and and uh, the people of Gadara there got so scared of him they asked him to leave. And so, what did he do? He left. And so he's on his way back across as he got in the boat, and they went to the other side. Verse 22, And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But the disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside... He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given to her to eat. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here to worship together and lift up your name in song. Father, we thank you for little love Harris Harris, who uh, followed you obediently this morning in baptism. Lord, we thank you for uh, the opportunity we have to come and to remember your death, burial, and resurrection through the observance of the Lord's Supper. Lord, be with us now as we uh, uh, observe this text, as we look at it and, and see the message you have for us today, that we may take it and use it for your glory and for your honor. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Crises, we all have them. We all face them sometime or another in our lives. It might be an illness. It might be the loss of a job. It might be uh, an unexpected expense or or something else, but we all have them at one time or another. 
And our tendency as human beings is to focus on the crisis and panic. When we focus on the crisis, we tend to get overwhelmed and fixate on the hopelessness of the situation, freaking out, thinking God has forgotten us and doesn't hear our cries of desperation. A friend of mine uh, one time says, when you focus on the problem, what you're doing is you are putting it between you and God. And all you see is the problem. And you can't see God. Even if the problem's real small, when, it's, when you're so fixated on it, you can't see God. But if you'll take that problem out of the way and you'll focus your attention on God, you can't even see the problem. Our God is bigger than our problems, than our crises. And today, I want to look at this scripture. And the first thing I want you to see in verses 21 through 24 is that Jesus hears us in our crisis. So many times what we do is we try everything else before we try the Lord. When in reality, what we should do is bring our crisis to the Lord first. Say, Lord, here, here's the problem. You know what it is. It didn't catch you by surprise. <laughs> May it surprise me, but it didn't surprise you. How are we going to fix this, Lord? How is this going to, going, to, going to come out? And he hears us as we cry out in our desperation. We can confidently come to Jesus with our request. If you look at verses 21 and 23, we see Jairus comes to Jesus with this request. Comes with him, uh, having heard who, about Jesus and who he was. Jairus, I'm sure, had tried everything else before he came to Jesus. And the reason I say that is this. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. In that day and time, the ruler of the synagogue was not a, 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 uh, a priest, not one of the Pharisees or the Sanhedrin. He was a lay person who had been put in charge of that synagogue. He was to make sure everything was in order for when people came there on the Sabbath day to worship. He was a man of uh, upstanding character. He was a man of, uh, that uh, was thought highly of in the community. And so now, here is, is this man who has power and prestige and, and uh, um, uh, character uh, in the community. And he is coming to Jesus for help. The problem is, by this time in Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees and Sadducees had already set their eyes on Jesus. We're trying to figure out some way to bring him down. So Jairus really was coming to Jesus at uh, um, having to lay aside all of his pride and all of his dignity. He had to lay aside what he thought his family and friends might say in all their prejudice and opposition to Jesus. He had to lay aside his profession with all of its protection and position and power. And he came to Jesus with his request. We can come to Jesus with our request. But when we do, we must come to Jesus in faith. You know, Jairus did that. And when we look at verse 23, he says, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Jairus had heard about Jesus, heard the great things he had done. He, he's healed people. He's given sight to the blind. He's, he's uh, given new legs to the lame. He's raised the dead. I, I've heard about this Jesus. He's in town. I need the help of this Jesus. He, he probably didn't understand that Jesus at the time was God in the flesh, but he knew that God was at work powerfully in Jesus' life, and he knew that it was God's power that would heal his daughter. So he asked Jesus to come and lay his hands on her that she may be healed and live. He came to Jesus by faith. Even in the midst of our crisis, Jesus hears us. We can come to him with our request. We can come to him with faith, but not only does Jesus hear us in our crisis. Second thing is, Jesus responds to us in our crisis. As you go on, verses 24 through 34, uh, we see uh, some things. We, we meet another character in this series. Jesus 
It says, went with him. So Jesus responded to Jairus' request. But then also we meet another person. And we know in meeting this person that we can approach Jesus in our suffering. This woman, verse 25, says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Here's a woman who had had a medical condition for 12 years where she was bleeding consistently. She had been to all the doctors. I like the way it says that, that she had suffered Many things from many doctors. How many of us suffer from the doctor? Mainly our wallet. And it says that she had spent all that she had in order to be healed, and none of them could do what what she wanted. Some of them, I'm sure, were well-meaning. Yes, I I think we can do this. You know, there's a reason they call it practicing medicine, right? You know, the doctors always say, well, I think we can do this. Well, let's try this. You know, they practice on you. Um, But I'm sure there were some other doctors who were just out to get her money. So, but she had suffered for 12 years, not found a cure, exhausted all of her resources. Finally, she heard about this Jesus. She had heard about what he he could do, what he had done for others. And she came to him uh, in her time of need. She approached him in her suffering, but also she approached Jesus in faith. We must approach Jesus in faith. She said, verse 28, she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I will be made well. She didn't even go up and confront him face to face. She came behind him. If if I can just touch the hem of his garment, So she lowered herself into a position of humility. She got down on the ground. She reached in. She was able to touch his garment. It says that she felt the power within herself and that her issue of blood was dried up and she was healed. Verse 30 says, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, before we get to Jesus asking who touched his clothes, let's let's go back and think about Jairus. All right? Jairus had come to Jesus in desperation. His daughter was dying. Came Jesus will you please come to my house and lay your hands on my daughter? She's at the point of death. I know you can do it, Lord. If you'll just come lay your hands on her, I know that she'll be healed and she will live. And I I can imagine that Jairus was thinking in his mind as as I might be and you might be, time is of the essence. Please hurry, Jesus. Please come on. The crowd was pressing uh, pressing in around them. It says that there was a the people thronged them. That means there were lots of people there, and, and, and you could hardly move. But Jairus, I'm sure, was, was, uh, was kind of, come on, come on, here we go. He's making the way. All right, everybody move, coming through, coming through. And, and, and then all of a sudden, Jesus stops and turns around. Jairus is saying, what in the world is he doing? And he asks the question, who touched me? And I'm sure Jairus, along with Peter and the rest of the guys, was equally as confused because uh, verse 31 says, His disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? Well, when you go to Luke's account of this, Luke names names, and said, Peter and those with him said this. What? All these people pressing in on you, and you ask, Who touched me? We're all touching you, Jesus. Come on. Jesus was, had been touched in a different way. He'd been touched by a person with great faith who had touched him needing healing. As he felt the power go out of his body. And he turned around and he saw the woman and says she was fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her. And she came, knowing that she had been busted, she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, listen to this, pay attention to this. 
He said, daughter, a term of endearment. He didn't chastise her. He didn't say, why didn't you ask me before you touched me? He, he, he gently dealt with her in her desperation and her suffering. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Let's look at that term daughter. Why, why did Jesus use the term daughter? One, I, I think he, he knew her desperation and he wanted her to know that it's going to be okay. You're, you're all right. I, I'm not going to hurt you. Think about who else was with Jesus. Who, who had come to him asking for his help? Jairus. Who did Jairus need help with? His daughter. Who was in charge of the synagogue? Jairus, the woman's condition for 12 years would have made her unclean. She would not have been permitted to worship in the synagogue with everyone else. Whose job was it to keep undesirables out of the synagogue? Jairus. Who would have had it turn her away? This daughter of God, Jairus. Yet now it's Jairus' own daughter who is facing death, and he needs help. He needs the help of this one, Jesus, the only one that he knows of that can help his daughter. Jesus stopped to help someone else's daughter. could be that Jesus used the term daughter to soften Jairus' heart at what was about to happen. Jesus hears us in our crisis. Come to him with your request. Come to him in faith. Jesus responds to us in our crisis. We can approach him in the midst of our suffering. We can approach Jesus in faith. And finally, Jesus has authority over every aspect of our crisis. Verses 35 through 43, are, are, uh, we return, our focus returns back to Jairus. And it says in verse 35, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking to this woman, saying, your, your faith has made you well. While he was speaking to the woman, one of Jairus' servants, a messenger from his household, came to her, came to him and said, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? You don't need to bother him anymore. Come on, let's go home. You need to mourn your daughter. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Believe in Jesus regardless of the circumstances. You see, the circumstance here may have said it's the end of the line. That's it, it's over. But Jesus says, I am the way. I determine where and when the end is. That's my call. The circumstance here may say it's hopeless. Don't bother the teacher anymore. But Jesus says, I am the lie. That's a lie. I am the truth. And the truth is that with me, it's never hopeless. The circumstance here says, death has come. That's it. It's final. But Jesus says, I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Believe in Jesus regardless of the circumstance. Also, believe in Jesus regardless of the skeptics. And there are a plethora of skeptics today. 
Everywhere you turn, there are skeptics. But they were there even in Jesus' day, even here at this time. In verse 37, it says, And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So as he was going with Jairus to his home, he said, Peter, James, John, you come with me. Everybody else, you got to stay here. All right. And so he, he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw the tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Now, the, the thing was, not everyone was there was really mourning for the death of this girl, especially with someone who has prestige in the community like Jairus. There were people there who were just putting on a show. They, they would come and they'd wail and they'd weep and they'd bring instruments and play them and, and, and just put on a big show. And many times the person would, would compensate them monetarily. So here are all these people. They come in and, and Jesus came, comes with Peter, James, and John. And they see this tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. And he says, why, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And verse 40 says, and they ridiculed him. They laughed at him. What are you talking about, man? She is dead. As as Jerry Clower would say, she is graveyard dead. She ain't getting up. And Jesus said, no. She's she's not. She's she's only sleeping. And then Jesus put him out of the house. See, y'all, y'all get outside. He stays there with Peter, James, and John, took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. He said, listen, y'all believe me, okay? Come, believe in me. Regardless of what the skeptics are saying, you come and you believe. Don't be afraid. So believe in Jesus regardless of the circumstance. Believe in him regardless of the skeptics. Why? Because we can believe in Jesus because he can be trusted. And Jesus proved who he was in the next thing that he did. Verse 41 says, he took the child by the hand and he said to her, little girl, get up. And she got up. And she walked. And it says they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. Now, Luke's account tells us that Jesus also told them, don't tell anyone what's happened. But Matthew's account says, and the report of this went out into all the land. Somebody talked. I'm not sure it was mom and dad. I think they were so, uh, so overcome with joy and so amazed. They were just enjoying their, their daughter. But you know those skeptics who were around and said, Oh, Jesus is crazy. There's no way that she's just dead, alive. She is dead. When that girl walked out the door and they saw that she really was alive, and she sat down and she began to eat, they began talking. I think it's kind of like the disciples when they were in that boat and Jesus calmed the storm and they said, who is this that com- commands even the waves be still? Who is this that takes dead people and makes them live again? Who is, maybe some of them that had followed him from, from where that woman had been, who is this that you just touch his clothes and you can be healed? Who is this Jesus? Jesus is who he says he is. He can be trusted. Believe in him regardless of the circumstance. Believe in Jesus regardless of the skeptics. And believe in Jesus because he can be trusted. Why? Because Jesus has authority over every aspect of your crisis regardless of what it is. I don't care what situation you're facing. Whether it's the loss of a job or a disease or some unexpected expense, uh, something that, that is just so overwhelming to you that you can't, all you can do is focus on it. Let me challenge you instead to focus on the Lord. In every situation, give thanks. You don't have to give thanks for the situation, but give thanks that God is at work. Because the Bible tells us that He is working all things to the good of those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose. He is working for our best interest in everything. So the thing that we think is awful and terrible, you know what? It didn't catch Jesus by surprise. 
It did not catch God by surprise. He is at work even in the midst of that. Even in the midst of Jairus' daughter being sick, God was at work. Even in the midst of 12 years of disease and sickness from this woman and all the doctors taking everything that she had, God was at work. He had a solution. God is at work in your crisis. He's at work in your life. God has a solution to your crisis. Focus on Him. Lift up His name in praise. Give honor and glory to Him. How do I know that? Because God has worked in my life to solve the greatest crisis that I have ever experienced. That's the crisis that I realized when I was nine years old. The crisis that was presented in front of me by my best friend's mother. That I was a sinner and I needed a savior. And she didn't put it exactly this way, but this is the reality of the situation. If I had never received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I died without him as my Savior, I would be destined for a devil's hell. And that's where I'd spend eternity. But praise God, God worked, and he had a solution to my problem. He heard my cry of desperation when I called out to his name. He heard me cry out. He responded to my cry. And he was faithful to his word. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It tells us that that we as human beings are already dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1 tells us that. Paul writing to the Ephesians says, You who were dead in trespasses and sin. You who were in crisis, in the crisis of your sin, dead in your own sin, destined for eternity in a devil's hell. And then you go on down from verse 1, you go on down to verse 4, and it starts with my very favorite word in the Bible, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. When you come to the realization that you are separated from God, and you cry out to him in your crisis, he will hear you. He will respond to your crisis. He already did that by going to the cross and dying on the cross, by shedding his blood, by his body being broken, by being put in a grave. And on the third day after that, he walked out of that borrowed tomb and, and that he had been placed in. And if you will believe with all your heart and call out to Jesus, confessing him as your Lord and Savior, he will be true to his word. He can be trusted. The Bible says you shall be saved. That's what God's word says. That's not Charlie Higgins' opinion. That's God's word. 